I was written after a talk that I did down here at the Theosophical yeah. Society. It was inspired by the poetry. That's um, great. Um, it there was some young flying around that song when we were in the calendar. <coughs> and the one yesterday, you said about um, the love is. I wrote this one about three, three weeks ago. In all I have written, in all I may write, place no trust, no credence. Or how can I describe the indescribable? How can I define the indefinable? How can I represent the love which is beyond my understanding and beyond the capacity of words to convey? Love is. Therein lies the truth. Their own, sorry, these are the only words I can use for no others are worthy. No other words have any power to express that which is beyond all expression. Love is, no more to say. If I were to write a thousand times more than I've written, still, I would, still there would not be one phrase, not one word, which could illuminate that which outshines all else except love is. It's all there if anyone wants to dip into yes. the nice. In the tradition of all the, the romantic poetry, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, How Do I Love Thee, Let Me Count the Ways, and back in those period, Walt Whitman, and... Mm. and that those. doesn't come into this category. I, this is I like, just write my thoughts. I know, much. this is great, though. This is like... Yeah. Go on for the truth. Straight at it. Expressing well, the love. Do you know well, and spell check the one. And spell check the one. You know, actually, those are, that's something that touches my heart is that, that I meet so many people that have done like you, and, and that's why it's all now into expressing it. You know, like when you have ideas like for calendars, like there was a man recently that wrote to me from, I think he was born in Chile, and he's he lives in Brazil, and he speaks uh, three different languages, but he. He's like a, one of these painters, you know, like just turns out these glorious, almost like a Picasso, one after the next, but they're all inspired by Horse of Miracles, Holy Spirit, Krishna Murray, and whatever. And, and he sent me, he says, here, please put this out, use this in any way that you can. He's got no sense of possession or ownership like painters tend to sometimes have over, you know, paintings, like numbered or... But, but I think that's what's coming, is poetry like that, and been put in, in beautiful ways where people can appreciate it, like these sayings that we put on the wall here, and or just getting it in some way where people can can ponder it. Mm -hmm. And this, this actually started six months after uh, our visit to Germany, and uh, it was Lynn's a couple of days before Lynn's birthday, and uh, I couldn't find a card with appropriate words, so I thought, oh, I'll just write a personal note on a blank card. So I got the blank card, and I uh, thought, right now, what shall I write? And all of a sudden, zap, this came pouring through me, and literally like you, you know, like you talk about Holy Spirit, and um, I, I didn't have a pen. I, I was running around the house looking for a pen from the find one, <laughs> and so I actually, there was a last line, which I couldn't remember, because my memory is not good. I, I remember the basis of it, but not the final line. And so I wrote a final line of my own, and then later on, well, after I'd given it to Lynn, and she'd read it, um, I told her about the line, the final line, and she said, yep, yeah, I knew that wasn't, that didn't work in with the poet. So I'll cut the final line out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'll read it to you if you don't. If you don't it was the very first one, and it, as I say, it came through so quickly that, um, well, I was staggered by it, to be honest. It's called, With All My Love. You are the center of who I am. You are the center of my universe and my existence. You share with me all that I am and all that you are. You, we are indeed one, for now and forever. There is and can be no end to our love, for we are love, and we are one with each other, and one with God. So that was the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's sorry. No, that's not the sorry. No, no, that's the yeah. perfect way to launch our, yeah. our morning. Thank you. Give me a second.
song we have told you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was a very good movie. We just talked briefly about it last night, but that's like at the core of everything that we will discuss and, and under every issue is this belief that there's private thoughts and private minds. And uh, frankly, only the thoughts of God can be shared. In other words, that's God shared God, and that's how Christ came into being, through sharing, through extending. And Christ extends, and Christ has creations, but they're purely spirit. So, it doesn't do any good to try to figure out what our offspring, our, our creations are. We have creative ability, because God gave us creative ability, and we have creations, and but these are all pure spirit. These are not, the we is not the bodies. And when we look at animals, they're not our offspring, you know, it's, these are pure spirit uh, creations. And so you might say that creation extends in a perfect line. God creates spirit, Christ, and Christ creates spirit, which are creations, and, and it just continues on in a continuous line. Uh, just like in this world, you know, we have, we have uh, genealogy and we have families, and families seem to extend on and on and on in a linear way. But you might say that in an eternal way, that's what creation is. It just extends and extends. But part of creation is is that that only the thoughts of God are real, so only the thoughts of God can be extended. So if you have thoughts that are not coming from God, they cannot be shared. So when you have thoughts in your mind that you feel guilty and shameful about, so shameful that you think you have to hide them and protect them and bury them in your awareness, it's because you're afraid of their, that they'll be shared, and you're afraid that your image will be damaged <laughs> if they're shared. But the good news is, they can't be shared. They don't go anywhere. Gossip, you know how people are so concerned about gossip in this world, as if a rumor starts and the rumor gets spread, and oh my <coughs> God, it's on, it's on television now, or it made the news, or whatever, like, like last night, you know, the embarrassment, the shame was these little personal secrets broadcast all over the, the United States, but the good news is what I'm sharing is, is that only the thoughts of God can be shared. You cannot share private thoughts. So can you move forward a bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, if you really start to, to be aware of the dynamics of what this means is, is that the attempt to share private thoughts is the sharing of nothing, is what Jesus calls the sharing of nothing. So what seems to be this big secret that could be shared, that could be damaged to somebody's image or whatever, there is no damage happening because, because these thoughts cannot be shared. Even though our educational system is based on the sharing of these nothingness thoughts, it's what education is. You know, you, you go and you read a book on geometry or on um, mathematics or on science or whatever, and you seem to learn knowledge and retain it, and then pass it on. Pass it on to your children or so forth. That that uh, Shakespeare had it right when he wrote, Much Ado About Nothing. That's what this world is, is much ado about nothing. Nothing's happening, nothing's really going on, and these thoughts that seem to be so private <coughs> and so secret that, that the mind, the persona, like holds them in and keeps them denied and repressed, it's all a big game because only the thoughts of God can be shared. So, if we look at perception, is there anything, anything at all, that involves perception, which is what the whole cosmos is about, that can be actually shared? And there's only one thing in all of perception 
it can be shared, and that's the Holy Spirit's perspective on the world. Uh, that is the only thing that's capable of being shared. Because, of course, the Holy Spirit represents God. It's the voice for God. It's the perspective. If God knew of a world, and if God uh, knew of time and space and images, um, then the Holy Spirit, since it's God's representative, would be that perspective. And that's what we call the happy dream, the real world, the forgiven world. Jesus uses many different names for this one perspective in the Course. Uh, he calls it true perception, even though all perception is false by definition, because God didn't create any of it. True perception means it's the closest that perception can come to the truth. It's purified. If all perception is the past, you might say that the Holy Spirit's perspective would then be a purified form of the past. Uh, cleansed of all of its judgments, all of its uh, categories. So we were talking about the other day when Jackie brought up the thing about what we were having with the breakfast table, and then the aha was, oh, even if I have a thought that tries to pull one image out of the whole tapestry, which we call Marianne Williamson, it doesn't matter what else we pack on to Marianne Williamson, but just the, the idea that we can pull Marianne Williamson out of the whole, out of the tapestry, is the judgment. Because there is only the whole. There is only the Holy Spirit's perspective, which sees the big picture. And having done paintings, you know that you can step back and look at the entire painting mm -hmm. and behold the whole thing at one, or you can focus in on particular elements, which is exactly what the ego does. It's very selective. It just focuses in on particular elements that it believes it can construct its own world based on these specific elements. But it's it highly variable. No two people see the same world. If you have a, a car smash up and there's ten eyewitnesses, you can get <coughs> ten different views and accounts of what happened. Because perception through the ego's lens is highly variable. And again, it cannot be shared. So, um, that's why relationships are so difficult in this world as well, because you have two human beings which represent different perspectives on everything. And they come together, even if, we'll say they're soulmates, and they come together and they have like 99.9% like agreement, there's always going to come that point where they wake up in bed one morning and, you believe what? You know, because the, the point zero one or whatever it is, is, is going to come up there, because by definition, no two people see the same world. And by definition, no two people can share anything except what? The Holy Spirit's perspective, uh, which would, of course, eliminate the two people <laughs> as well. Because <laughs> there are no two people in the Holy Spirit's perspective. Everything is unified. Everything is one. So, this it really starts to, to give you a little bit of a, an underpinning for why you really are innocent. is because all of these private thoughts have not tainted or damaged your innocence. Your innocence remains intact. Because God created you innocent, and because the Holy Spirit has a, per, a perception or a perspective on the world that retains the innocence, that reflects the innocence of, of the love or of heaven. So, this is the convincing job that the Holy Spirit has, you know, to convince you that you're divine instead of mortal. <laughs> that's, and that's the Holy Spirit's job. All you have to do is have the willingness to open up and to move in that direction, and of course, the result is inevitable. It has to be, if that's God's plan, that there's nothing you can really do to, uh, to delay or to stop or to prevent God's plan uh, from, from reaching its course, which is, you know, perfection or innocence. And Margaret was bringing up today some of those feelings again with watching that TV. You go through phases <coughs> where, in terms of humor, I think I've watched like lots of television shows and I've watched lots of comedians and those video shows funniest videos and all this and that, and, and slapstick comedy, we were talking about um, the Marx Brothers, but more so like uh, the Three Stooges, 
um, a lot of knockdown, a lot of slaps, a lot of punches, and people will sit there and laugh and laugh and laugh as they watch human beings blasting <laughs> each other. Was it Larry, Curly, Mo? Was it mm -hmm. the ones? It was like that we could call that a bit like ego humor, uh, in the sense that uh, you know the ego. All a lot of the put down comedians we were talking about is the same kind of a, a thing. But then once you get deeper to the point where you start to realize that these are just private thoughts and that they really can't be shared, then there's the gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit, or it's like the gentle humor, cosmic humor of seeing that none of this is so. Then you can really laugh. Before you come back to that point, then it's like Margaret said, it can even seem a bit sad. We had some sadness coming up, almost like mockery, <coughs> like, like there was a mockery going on. and. So that's a phase of starting to look look upon the ego and its cruel humor, uh, trying to make something laughable more as just a distraction uh, than than actual healing. But when you get even much deeper, you start to see that none of the private thoughts have any validity or reality. Then it's the gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit, like my child choose again. This is not so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's light. There's a lightness to it. So that's really the goal of working with your mind training, is to reach that gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit, you know. Aha! I'm not fooled by that anymore. You can just kind of see it for what it is, and watch it in, not by the bait. You are empowered. You, you have dominion over it. <laughs> Some of the comedy programs are okay. <laughs> like the Vicar of Diddley. Mm. These are UK ones. Mm. But the modern, the modern, you know, stand-up comedians. Um, the ego, the, the ego is more than the comedians of the old. You know, the more they can shock. Um, you know, it's what they're saying. I think the ego works more. It's working more. Or whether I'm noticing it, you know. It's... Um, Shock, it's, you know, shock people. But the ratings go up like that program last night, the, the film last night. <laughs> Drama, sensationalism, mm. it's like the thing in the gossip magazines mm. to try to grab attention. And the way out, of course, the way out of drama is to start again to see that these are private thoughts. That, that that can't be shared. The part of the drama <coughs> is there seem some thoughts that seem to be so terrible, so horrific that it's like they're kept secret, and then the exposing of the ones that have kept secret can seem to bring shame until you can even go deeper and start to see that that they never really had any reality in the first place. There was no need to hide them. Uh, there was no need to bury them because they weren't dangerous. So that's, that's the key to this whole whole thing. And people feel shameful about all kinds of things, but it, it all gets back to comparisons, you know, whenever there's shame around personality characteristics of the body or this or that. It's always, it's like it says, uh, uh, comparison must be an ego device for love makes, you know, comparison for love makes none. You know, it's a very simple line, but when you take that one simple line and you start to apply it to your mind, then you'll notice, ah, anytime I'm comparing or analyzing or whatever, then that is the ego. And I, it's not that I want to stop doing that, it's what, that I want to come to the realization that I never had the ability to do it in the first place. 
because people will say all the time to me, oh yeah, I've got this chatter, mind chatter going on in my mind, and it's comparing, and analyzing, and judging all the time. And how do you stop it, David? You know, it seems unstoppable. I've tried to meditate, I've tried to use affirmations, I've tried to use music, I've tried to distract my way from it, and this mind chatter just goes on and on. It's like a really bad habit, so deeply ingrained that I can't seem to stop it. And I say, yeah. How do you stop a runaway train? Uh, you don't. <laughs> you have to get even deeper in your mind to a point and start to question, how could there even be a runaway train? You know, how could, instead of trying to stop the runaway train, you could start questioning, how could it even start? How could there be a runaway train? You know, and that's what Jesus is saying, you know, in the section about how is judgment relinquished? He says basically, you know, you have to come to the this awareness that you never were given the ability to judge in the first place. If God created you, if God creates you to be a judge, and if you're created in the likeness and image of God, is God a judge? You know, of course we were raised with Christian images of God, zapping tribes here and there, and you know, issuing threats and getting angry, but that was of course the ego's own God, it made up its own God, it wasn't the real God. God is not a judge, God does not even know what punishment means, or he's not lording over anybody, like you better behave or you'll pay, you know, none of that has anything to do with the real God. God is just pure love, and if we are a creation of, of that pure love, we must be like God. So. Instead of trying to stop the runaway train, and being frustrated of not being able to, it's to really just open your mind to the experience of, oh, this, I could never have been the one that was judging. I could never have been the one that was criticizing in the first place, because I was created by God. And that's how you get a perspective on the ego, of you're not it. You are not the ego. You cannot be the ego. You can't be a creation of God and be the ego. So this is where we get back, back, back. And it's a good thing to ponder, but again, what we always bring up is, in a practical way, what really starts to bring the release is when we are talking and sharing and you bring up issues or troubling thoughts, and in the exposing, and in the, it's like that first poem that you were reading about the dove, it's about you, and just, I let you go, I do not need you anymore, you know, in coming to that, that state, then we are, we are truly free. I do not need you anymore, thought. Whatever you seemed to be in my life before, doesn't matter now, I do not need you anymore. You don't need to hang on. You don't need to hang on anymore. You <coughs> need to react. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to catch yourself acting or buying into a situation. For me, I think that's been extremely helpful for me. I think Kirsten called it at the course the other day, biting into an apple. I thought that was really good. I thought about that a lot. And that gave me great awareness as well. Don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> that was really great. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Something that had <clears throat> quite an impact on me yesterday was something Jason read. Was that uh, we are a host to God, and it meant a lot to me because uh, I tried to express it a little bit yesterday, but the, the idea that we are spirit, or the truth that we are spirit, not that idea, is something which is quite difficult to grasp because unless you're experiencing it, spirit doesn't really mean anything. Whereas to use the host of God 
if you were the host of God, clearly you can't be anything else but the host of God. And that gives you something more of an anchor, if you know what, what I mean to hold on to. It seems to be a more tangible thing than spirit to be the host of God. Yeah, it's beautiful, almost like a play on words of Jesus, you know, would you be host to God or hostage to the Well, that was what uh, Jason read <laughs> yesterday, and I think that was my immediate thought. Yeah. But that's it, that basically those are your two choices. <laughs> you get to pick between those two. And, and then the more it becomes apparent, like, well, that's not a difficult decision, then, then you have the peace. I think it's where the pleasure comes in. It's like, if I've told people, if this world was nothing more than wicked darkness, just, just terrible, you could drop it like a hot potato. I mean, imagine somebody says, here, and they throw you a potato that's been roasting on the fire, and you go, ah, ah, and drop it immediately. <laughs> because, you know, what's the point in holding on to a hot potato? Unless you like to get fried fingers, <laughs> uh, you know, some people may. Some people do 150 fingers up. Right. Which out of So, if the world was just wicked evil, and you saw it as wicked evil, you would drop it like a hot potato. I mean, it really wouldn't be a difficult decision. But it's the pleasure pain factor. It's that the ego disguises lumps of guilt in pleasureful forms. And you go for, you're attracted to the pleasure, so you go for it, and that's where the fool's gold comes in, you know. Look at the, the things of the world that are valued. We talked a little bit about Marilyn Monroe, fame, money, beauty, sex appeal, all famous husbands, you know, all the associations that go with that. To the world, those are all very pleasurable things. In fact, the world would say, you've done very well. If you can get one of those things, you, the world would say, very well. Just one of them. Oh, you're famous. Even though you're broke, your body's breaking down, you're, you're all these other things, but you're famous. <laughs> you know, it's like, at least you got one. But, but isn't it great when you find these icons that seem to symbolize getting all of them and being suicidal, being depressed, then, uh-huh, there must be some kind of trick going on here. If you, if, and we're talking about these are things that masses of people, if you went throughout the planet, even like third world countries, underdeveloped countries, sometimes, I've, I mean, I've talked to some people that have been to some very underdeveloped third world countries, and they'll say, the natives were happy. Mm -hmm. And then when the foreigners came and introduced all these innovations, better crops, better housing, better medicine, better, 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 better. Suddenly the, ma the natives thought, we are poor and underdeveloped. <laughs> and the misery started. <laughs> it wasn't until they had a contrast experience. They were happy. It was like, oh, life is simple. You know, I, I think of some of the, I think it was the Hopi Indians that were literally, they had a ritual that at the end of the year, they, everybody would gather all their possessions, everything that they'd, they'd accumulated throughout the year, and they'd put them all together and have a big bonfire. <laughs> they'd burn them all. Isn't that great? You know, I mean, it's just like the symbol of, of the opposite of hoarding <laughs> and saving. It's like the more the, the way of the world has been, you know, whoever dies with the most toys wins the game. And the Hopis were like, oh no. Those are possessions. Let's, let's burn them and make sure we do it every year, <laughs> so we don't ever get caught into that trap. But but everything is kind of backwards and upside down in this world. So as soon as you start to realize this, then it's life can start to become more fun because then you start to realize I don't have to play by the world's rules anymore. I don't have to hoard and control and possess and be so afraid if if I think that. If I don't have these possessions, then I won't have any safety and security and happiness. Because you can learn from the symbols of the world and the witnesses that people who have done that route uh, do not find happiness. Uh, they, they've bought into the fool's gold. And those things are only important in terms of pleasure. Um, it's like, 
when you really start to take a look at what, what is the beneficiary of, of money and possessions and all these skills and abilities, it, it is the body. Um, a mind does not need money. I mean, what would a mind need money for? If you're, if you're a mind, and a mind is just a mind, and mind is very content of being a mind, um, there's no, it has no need of money. Uh, or possessions, or houses, or countries, or any of those things. The mind has no need of any things, but, but bodies, when you have a body identity, then suddenly these kind of things become very important, because money is exchangeable for many things that could be helpful for a body. So if you're identified with the body, then these things would become very important to you. So the more that you forgive, the more that you release these beliefs and this identification with the body, then the less you would need these other things. Because what meaning would they have? You know, it's not your sustenance, it's not your safety, it's not your security. But if you identify with the body, then it does seem to be your safety, your sustenance, and security. And then these imaginary things take on great importance. And people will fight wars over them. and and go through scheming and all kinds of wild, crazy schemes to, uh, to get or to protect these imaginary things. So it's st we start to have a little bit of a context, and that's the pleasure-pain thing. Um, in this world, pleasure and pain seem to be very different. And yet, when you get into the Course, Jesus says, it is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain saying basically that if you think that you can maximize the pleasure and minimize the pain, you're in for a big shock at some point. But this whole world is based on the possibility that it's possible to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. So that's what uh, Jesus calls in the obstacles to peace, uh, he calls the attraction to guilt. When you first read those words in the Course, I remember I was reading through the book and I got to the obstacles to peace and uh, and he, he had in there um, the attraction to guilt and I thought, that is sick, that is sick, the attraction to guilt, that is that sounds very sick. And then he had the attraction to pain, that is sick. And then he had the attraction to death, I said, and that is sick. And he basically says, yeah, your mind if you're invested in this world, it is sick. <laughs> and these are the dynamics underneath that is making your sickness. You are attracted to the very things that you really don't want, that will not serve you in, in eternity. And at one point, he said, everyone who comes here is a death worshiper. Well, that's an interesting thing to be called, the death worshiper. <laughs> you know, gee, it didn't, I didn't think I was a death worshiper. I was, <coughs> I thought that, that maybe there was a tribe somewhere of uh, cannibals over in Africa or something that, uh, you know, maybe were a little more into death worship and eating people and everything, but I, I'm civilized. I, I'll eat anybody in this lifetime at least. And, but no, Jesus says, underneath, to believe in the ego is to be a death worshiper, because the ego is death. And to invest your mind in something that is death would be to be a death worshiper. You know, these are kind of strong words. And at times, you know, he he uses, you know, some really kind of grotesque imagery, you know, it's talking about uh, uh, rubies that are like uh, blood, and, you know, he, he uses like graphic, graphic ways of describing that, that you're making an idol of something that really has no meaning whatsoever. And before you release your faith in it, your belief in it, you have to start to see things open-eyed for what they are. And that's why when people look at the Course, they say, if, if everything's about love, why does he talk so much about the ego? There's more stuff about the ego in that book than love, even as far as topics go. And I say, well, it's just that the mind is so invested in the ego, and it's so addicted and so uh, mesmerized by the ego that, that the ego is what has to get exposed. The love just is. Uh, you really don't have to do anything to love, uh, and you can't make yourself love, because love is what you are. 
and he even says that in the uh, introduction. He says, uh, this course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is far beyond what can be taught. It simply aims at removing the obstacles to look the awareness of love's presence. So that, right there in the introduction, is a perfect context. So that when you go through life, instead of trying to find the perfect mate to fall in love, it's more like, no, if I do find a mate that I want to be with, it will be more about forgiveness or about uh, releasing uh, specialness or releasing, discovering and releasing the obstacles than falling in love. Love is already it. It just simply is. So you're not going to fall in it. Uh, be fortunate. Oh, I'm lucky. I fell in love. <laughs> you might have fallen in romantic love, but there's going to be some interesting uh, lessons involved with that one. <laughs> Maybe a bit off, a bit off a bit of the apple there. Like they talk about it, Adam and Eve <laughs> taking the bite out of that apple. But, but then again, all for the good. If you if you keep it in the context, like, oh, this is good. This is for the removal of the obstacles then you have a context for it. Then when things seem to go terribly wrong, when the wheels fall off and everything, instead of going, this is terrible, this is terrible, my life is in shambles, you can say, oh, there's something good here to work with. There must be a major lesson <laughs> to learn here. So you see a, a much different context mm -hmm. for it. Look, uh, for the, from the love's perspective, let the ego instead of being there and, and trying to reach for love. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how I read the Course the first time round, I recognize now, when you talk about all those, when he talks about the ego and all these grotesque images that he has. Um, I skipped over that. Like that, you know where the, he, he describes the ego as the frame, yeah. and he talks about it in all grotesque terminology. And then you get a bit further along in the course and he talks about the frame being the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And, oh yes, I'll read that. that that's lovely. <coughs> that's love. And I, yeah. <laughs> so I was searching for love and all yeah. of it. And not, and, and the ego would still avoid looking at itself. And I can see now that's what I did. That's, that, that was really strong, the ego even taking the book mm -hmm. and saying, well, no, I'm still going to ignore that. So it's, yeah. it was just a misuse of the whole thing. Yeah. That's, that's a good point of getting at this whole topic of resistance. I, yeah. I had a friend of mine uh, who was originally from England named Dorothy, and, and she was the chef, the head chef at this place that used to be in the Catskill Mountains called the Foundation for a Course in Miracles, where people would come from all over the world to translate the course, to study the course. It was kind of a, the first really worldwide center and she was the chef there, and she would say that when the teacher would do a workshop on special relationships, that they would have to order four times as much food <laughs> as normally, just for that workshop, because they always ran out of food immediately uh, at the special relationship workshop. They had to run out to the stores and everything, so they learned, oh, he's doing well on special relationships, let's get four times as much. It didn't matter who the people were, didn't matter where they come from, because they came from all over the world. The resistance to looking open-eyed and exposing these kind of things about special relationships, especially the special love relationship. I mean, that's in this world, that's the pinnacle of striving. Why do people who have crazy careers, to do crazy things to earn, you know, money? They do it so that they can have money and houses and cars and things, for what purpose? For the special love relationship. You know, if, as they say, if you're lucky enough, if you, if you meet the world on the world's terms and you're successful, then the next step is use your success to get that perfect love partner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they'll call it the object of your desire, you know. Use everything that you've gathered to get the object of your desire. Well, of course, the miracles comes along and says, love has no object. Oh my gosh. Love is? Love has no object. No object. What, what, what does that mean, no object? You know, it's, it's like, 
It's like when we're getting into universal love, unconditional love. If love doesn't have an object, then it just means, wow, that must be a very different goal that I'm going for, because because the ego has made an object to focus the love on, and that object is a substitute for the real thing. In other words, in heaven there's this just perfect love, light, perfect understanding and everything, and all power and glory are of God. What do we have in this world that when somebody talks about power, you may talk about hydroelectric power, solar power, military power, the power of persuasion, interpersonal power, the power of positive thinking, power, think of all the different things that power goes under in this world, and none of them have anything to do with real power. Because none of them have anything to do with God. There's no electricity in heaven, no solar power, power of persuasion. What good is the power of persuasion going to do you in heaven? Who's to, who is there to persuade? <laughs> you know? Or you've, you've heard that they have a very powerful personality. Oh, do they, huh? You think in heaven they have powerful personalities? There is no personality <laughs> in heaven. Heaven personality is a mask. Mm -hmm. So think of that. And think of what love goes for. We have puppy love, we have romantic love, you know, we have love of your country, love of your heritage, uh, sports teams, you know, I love my New York Yankees, or I love my, you know, I mean, love, 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 bumper stickers, I, heart, and then fill in the blank, all the things. But now, wait a minute, those are all what? Substitutions for the real thing, because the real thing has no object. Love has no object. Love just is. It doesn't objectify at all. So, so this is what we're looking at, that the ego had, has seemed to lure the mind to sleep away from the kingdom of heaven, and now it's got to come up with substitutes. Why would you stay in a barren place that was totally loveless? Um, why would you stay you know, in a desert? What would be the point of staying in a desert? unless the ego made up substitutes. And so it constructs substitutes for the real thing, and tries to lure the mind to fall for the substitutes. And then the mind does, and it feels guilty, because it's still not waking up to its true reality. So this is the game of the ego, to make substitutes for the real thing, and to get you to fall for the substitutes. And when you begin to wake up spiritually, you start to say, I am not going to fall for these. I'm not going to bite anymore. I'm not going to fall for the, the temptations, the lures of the substitutes. Because there's something greater, there's something real that awaits me if I simply will give my willingness to open to it. This is really exposing the ego. You know, it's like exposing the game. This is the kind of stuff that the ego does not want you to know about, because it's out of business. If you start to understand what's really going on underneath, then you simply cease to play the game. And there was one time Helen Shuckman was the scribe of the Course, and she was sitting one day, and, and Jesus again started speaking in her mind, and, and Jesus asked Helen Shuckman a question. And the question was, what do you do if you find yourself in a desert? And Helen was like, this is some kind of game or riddle or <laughs> from Jesus. <laughs> what do you, imagine Jesus Christ saying to you, what do you do if you find yourself in a desert? And she, she just pondered and pondered and pondered. She just could not answer him. It's like, what do you want of me? <laughs> How should I answer you, Lord? <laughs> Uh, and finally Jesus gave the answer, leave! <laughs> uh, and that is equally applicable for all of us, you know. Again, if the world was wicked evil, you would drop it like a hot potato. You would leave immediately. But the ego has not turned this world into wicked evil. So I can make it 
I can do better than that. I can make some, at least some aspects of it attractive. But it's like, you know, whatever, this world, you do not leave this world in part. You, you have to decide to leave for sure or not. You know, it's not like maybe. <laughs> maybe gets you into reincarnation. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. You could spend thousands of years in maybe. Maybe won't get you there. But once you get to a point of, of getting past the, the lures and the attractions, then, then it's like, okay, my maybe is, is changed to, okay. Yes. And that's, we had the song yesterday, The Power of Goodbye. <laughs> that's what you can do. Some of you might have seen the movie The Truman Show. Yeah. In case I don't see you, you can say to the ego, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> it's over. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> and goodbye. So in practical terms, in, in my life, I say goodbye to everything that doesn't have a purpose for awakening, essentially. So it, everything that I can say, what is this for? And if if it's work, if it seems to be helpful in removing the blocks, then it's then it has a, a purpose. I'm yeah. following a thought here. Yeah. It has a purpose. So anything that doesn't seem to have a purpose for removal of blocks is the hot potato. Yeah. And you let it go. Yes. And then, then, once you get into that, then the rest of the journey becomes very simplified because then it's simply transfer of training. Like, like you can start to go boom, 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 all these different aspects of your experience on Earth. You can say, okay, let's, you may even get a piece of paper out or a notebook out and say, oh, okay, here's all the things that I'm dealing with on a daily basis or on a weekly or yearly basis. You know, I've got, I've got house, I've got cars, I've got children, I've got life insurance, I've got health insurance, I've got automobile insurance, I've got, uh, you know, homeowner's insurance, I've got uh, medical insurance, I've got a retirement plan, I've got, you know, just really write it all down. Mm. And then look at all of it from the perspective of how does it serve you. Like, that's what I've been doing all these gatherings for 17 years, like, like, like insurance, for example, that's an interesting topic, you know. Uh, you listen to insurance agents talk and they say, you know, this is a very good thing. You know, you put some money down as a premium, and now uh, everybody, a bunch of people put a premium down, and then if one house gets burned down, or one body gets sick, or whatever, then the money gets used to help that, rebuild that house or that body. Sounds like a good sell. Then, then I come in, and I'm not really a really good insurance salesman. I say, no, insurance is a bet against yourself. You're wagering. <laughs> you go in and buy health insurance, you're wagering. Let's say you put down, um, $900. It's a $900 bet that you'll get sick. That's what, uh, if you pay $900. Let's just say you put, you put $10,000 in health insurance. That's a $10,000 bet that you'll get sick. And the only way that you collect, uh, and you win the bet is to get sick. Now that's so cheap. Uh, the insurance people don't like this. They say, get him out of here. This is not, this kind of reasoning is not, it's a ruining business. Uh, or life insurance. Let's say you buy a, a hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy, or two hundred thousand, and you have to pay, I don't know, maybe hundreds of, or tens of hundreds, or thousands of dollars of premiums to maintain your life insurance. That's a bet that you're going to die. I don't even believe that I can die now, so I wouldn't do very good at getting a life insurance policy. For what? You know, people say, well, if not for you, David, there's people that is going to have to bury the body or do something like that, at least for the funeral. And they, I don't care. My, my grandfather, Heinrich Hermann Hoffmeister, they used to ask him about that, and they would say, what are you going to do when you die? And Heinrich Hermann Harry would say, throw the body over the, over the side of the hill. <laughs> that was, that's about how much concern he had for the body. 
throw the body over the hill. Okay. I don't know if that fits with legal <laughs> legal constraints. <laughs> Maybe we could find some rare island in Fiji or whatever, or it's uninhabited, burn it, burn it, burn it, or whatever. But you see, if you start to see health insurance as a bet that you're going to get sick, and life insurance is a bet that you're going to die, and the only way that you collect is to get sick and to die, then you start to, to rethink these things, like, well, is it really that important? <laughs> and then when you get into these things, like, some people will say, well, life insurance isn't for you, it's for your survivors. Who are these survivors? Where are these survivors? There is no, people have said, when you die, the world will go on. What if the world is just a figment in, in, of imagination that's in your mind? And when you let go of the figment, the figment's gone. People think that, that when a person dies, that the world just continues on. But, but once you start to realize that it's like a projection of the mind, and it really isn't there at all, it's just a, it's like in quantum physics, it's just a total projection, and that when you give up the ego, then the projection disappears. And you were just fooled by the projection, you know, it wasn't like there's something... So you don't have anybody to leave any money to. You don't have to worry about leaving uh, money and property and resources because there isn't nobody to do that. You see, it's like a whole, this is not going to go over well in the insurance business no. or the cemetery business. Or it, because they make a big deal out of death, you know, tombstones and buying property and, you know, investing in all these things. Even insuring property, the insurance people insist that you have locks and securities in your house, otherwise it's not covered. Which is a double sort of demand, you know, that you're, you're now buying into being robbed as well as being... It's not enough to have, <laughs> have theft insurance, but now you got to go out and buy locks! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually a proven fact uh, that the people with the most locks get the most amount of robbery. <laughs> it is a fact, it is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that. Yeah, because you leave the laundry door open all day and nobody ever comes in. <laughs> well, I don't insure my house, and I'm probably the only one in all of Ireland that doesn't insure the house because I don't believe. I believe if I insure my house, I'm calling for it to go on mm, fire. Yeah. 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 It's funny too, I mean, I have, I get, being done all this work of spirituality, somebody within the last month who was on a spiritual network sent me, said, alert, alert, you know, like they send you all the virus alerts, you know, this, but this was an alert, they've, they've invented, thieves have been using this for, for years, they said, it's a type of, of key that you can slide in and then it's got some kind of a rubber thing and you can shake it and shake it and it will, it, the tumbler the inside of most keys will line up with this device and then you can just open any door. <laughs> it's like, and they said, it's terrible, it's available on the internet now for 1995. <laughs> you know? I was like, I was like, hallelujah! It's like, now they've invented uh, just a simple device for 1995 that you can just jiggle for a while and then it just opens any lock. <laughs> yeah. Except they have, then the locksmith says, we have special locks, more expensive <laughs> locks that this can't open, you know. But also this thing of sharing, there was a time, there was a, there was basically, you know, all the stuff about copyright and ownership around movies and music and so forth that artists are really concerned about. There was a, uh, I think it was a Chinese young man, uh, who I think when he was 17, he developed uh, a, a file sharing program on the internet, it was called Nutella, and uh, basically what it was, was that individual computers all over the world could share electronic files with no uh, sense of monitoring. Like there's no sense of a, of a government um, or a, a central monitoring thing. He developed a technology where you could share movies, m music, any kind of information completely in a way that it could not be monitored. Uh, so this was a very important uh, technology because Suddenly on the internet, people were sharing everything, you know, and, and to the world this was disaster. This is like, this is the end of capitalism, this is the end of, of whatever, of, of, of reciprocity. Of, I mean, if everything could be freely shared, I laughed because I thought, wow, the whole teachings of the Course is that only 
the thoughts of God can be freely shared. And so this is a symbol on the internet. A 17 year old Chinese boy came up with a way of doing this where there's no way to stop it or monitor it. Unlike, uh, there was a, a music sharing program that there was huge lawsuits about Napster. Napster initially because Napster had a central monitoring point but people were sharing all this music and all these files and of course it was shut down and uh, you know the world has its ways. But, but this is what you, I mean by finding symbols that the world as we've known it is, is coming to an end. And you can prepare for that now by releasing all these crazy thoughts and beliefs in ownership and possession and control because only the ego sponsors those beliefs and only the ego will be tormented and distraught over what seems to be a breakdown of, of its world, of its society. It's happened. In fact, it's over and done, actually. <laughs> when you were speaking earlier on about fear, um, in Job in the Old Testament said, Do thy fear And that is, that is too very valid. What you fear, you will relax. Mm -hmm. Uh, as people who have feared that their child would be knocked down crossing the road, and they were here knocking the road, crossing the road. And there's so many examples of this. But that's, again, right in case right into the insurance companies' uh, hands, because uh, we insure things, and we worry, we, we fear, because we fear being robbed, or our house being burned down, etc. So fear is a is as powerful as faith, because it, it is almost like a faith in, in the burning down, or in the burning down. Yes, last mm -hmm. night, uh, after everyone left, Therese brought up the, the law of attraction, mm -hmm. and we could call it just the divine law of as you sow, so shall you reap, and what goes around comes around, and giving and receiving are the same, and you could call it by any name that you want, and that's what you're talking about with the fear as well. And, and what Jesus says is, right now, that very law is imprisoning you, but it will ultimately release you. In other words, you're just misusing the law. <laughs> as long as you have fear in your mind, you're drawing and attracting to yourself fearful reflections or witnesses, consequences, and, but it's the same law that will set you free when you realize the power of the mind and what the law is. Not that the law of attraction can be used to, to bring material abundance and you think that that will actually free you from this world, because that's sometimes what you see with some people who say, Ah, I was, I was attracting nothing, only witnesses of scarcity, but now I have the Maserati, and the mansion, and the soulmate, and all these other things, so that now I'm, I'm using the law of attraction to bring myself material abundance, because, again, abundance is not really, is not material, it's a state of mind. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the material realm. So that would be, we would say, or mentioned you brought up the law of attraction, you might say, someone may say, I was ignorant of it, but then I became aware of it, and then I started to use it in a very productive way, and now I'm a millionaire, <laughs> or a billionaire, or something like this, that would, would be still not really getting at what the law really is, because it's giving and receiving are the same, and sowing and reaping are there, but, but what you really want to sow is, is thoughts of God, and what you want to reap is eternal life, you know, not some material outcome, which will never bring you eternal life, you know, that's still buying into the egos, looking for a form outcome. So it's, it's good, I think it's, it's just a way the humankind seems to have been misusing the eternal law. We do have a, a movie called Solaris, which is basically, as they get closer to this planet, then they start to become more aware of this divine law, but then they it's just a speed up like an MTV last night. They start to see that uh, they really start to get down to what do I really want? Uh, once you start to get closer to the divine law, that question becomes more and more important. What is it that I truly value? What is it that I truly want?
we started with like a session today with the responsibility of the site. And I thought maybe you could like go through each of these lines and like differentiate between what's manifestation and how, how to look at it. Because it seems like mm -hmm. some of these lines can be easier mm -hmm. to interpret. It's like the I'm responsible for what I see mm -hmm. section of the verse. Mm -hmm. So I'll read each one and you can read it. Okay. I'm responsible for what I see. Yeah, the, the correct interpretation of that would be, I am responsible for how I see. In other words, for the perspective that I look upon seeing, perception of the world. So, it's I know that that line right there has been misused. I've seen course teachers, you know, use it with students and say, you know, I am responsible for what I see. You're responsible for the starving children in Africa. You're responsible mm -hmm. for AIDS. You're responsible for that tsunami, you're responsible, and the students are like this. I get there and the students are bound up in guilt. They feel guilty, guilty, guilty. The Course has made me really feel guilty. Because look, it says I am responsible for what I see. And I look on the news and I think, I did all of that. No, no, no. You're responsible for how you see it. You're responsible actually for seeing it with the Holy Spirit. That you are responsible for. You know, you. And, and if you try to take responsibility for anything other than seeing it with the Holy Spirit, you're going to get into guilt, of course. Because how could you not? You know, in this wacky, crazy, distorted world. Including what the body, some people would say the body has a certain sickness. To say I'm responsible for that is the same error. Same error. You know, you're responsible for how you see the world and how you see the body. Include, of course, the Holy Spirit's perspective is really where the true responsibility lies. So, yeah, that would again be a misuse of the responsibility word, because you would get into guilt. Uh, and when and you hear people say, I created this cancer, oh yeah, uh, and I feel guilty. Well, of course, I mean, if you're going to use the book that way, uh, you're going to feel guilty, because it's like, I did this, and it's like, it's like, the Course is saying, no, you, you're responsible for how you're looking upon the world. Are you going to look upon the world through the ego's personal perspective, or through the Holy Spirit's whole perspective? You know, you always have those choices. So which interpretation am I going to see? Wholeness or fragmentation? You know, how I see the world is my choice. Is it, oh no, Alan Schulman is it? Alan Schulman? Yeah, the wrote it. Do I understand right of the conversation that that me is that she wasn't happy with what she wrote? It mm -hmm. was she had went ahead and wrote it all, but yet she didn't follow it on. It was like it's, a split mind that she mm. yeah she was like mm. a channel or a scribe and yeah the, yeah the point I'm making is you are responsible for what you say. How you see it. Yeah, but, but it says in there, you are responsible for what you say. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Yeah. yeah. I'm just giving So is it your interpretation that what she's actually saying is, you are responsible for how? Yeah. Yes, it? actually, Jesus wrote the book. She just put the words in. <laughs> Helen moved the pen, uh, the shorthand, but she didn't write the book. She scribed the book from Jesus. In fact, Jesus would would have her tell her, just like you received the poetry, would tell, would come, and then she would write it down, and then he would often have to go back and say, what I said was this, what you wrote was this, the ego would even <laughs> write something different than what Jesus told her. He'd have to go back and correct, correct for seven years to get this, but Jesus wrote this book, so to speak. This, this is, these words come from an awakened mind. Now, in terms of the interpretation, what Jason's doing is, human beings read this book, and the words are from Jesus, but they, they, they read the book through the ego filter, and they will misuse, they will not grasp the meaning of what he's actually trying to teach. And they will, you know, the ego can misuse scripture, even. it can misuse anything in form, including words. We've seen what happened with the Bible over the years, the Crusades, killing Muslims in the name of Jesus, and, you know, the ego can misuse anything. And so what we're doing here is simply, is, is a call for clarity, because these very words in this section have been 
misused by Course in Miracles students and teachers, mm -hmm. and they still ha they still feel guilty. They don't feel happy, joyful, released. So th I'm just trying to give a meaning, or we're just trying to explore the what is the the accurate interpretation, the most helpful interpretation of the words that mm. basically Jesus said. I just through. find it funny really, you know, if, if God zoomed into Ellen, you know, to put that down, why didn't he say, you see, how you see things? Oh, he does in many places, it's just in this yeah. particular line. What I see, um, you know, it's, it can be interpreted in, in different ways, and mm -hmm. what we're trying to zoom into is what is the helpful meaning. All of these words are just pointing at a, at a perspective or a meaning, mm -hmm. and the words can't get you there. In other words, some people say this is scripture, and uh, like you're saying, if Jesus really meant how, then why didn't he put how <laughs> instead well, of what? Yeah. And this yeah, is you see, because if I read that, <laughs> yeah. you know, you are responsible for what you say. That would be it, full yeah. stop. Yeah. Oh, and believe and me, would... I've worked with students. They, yeah. They'll come to me. They'll they find every contradiction in the book, and Jesus used the wrong words here, and he should have done this and this and this, and all of that is just seek, seeking to change the world. This is the world. This, oh, this is the world, and even when, yeah. when we want to edit Jesus and go, oh, in fact, that's what Helen did when she was taking all this down. She said to Bill one time, if he misspells one word, that's over. It's all <laughs> it's like looking for a reason <laughs> to dump Jesus. I mean, if he misspells one word, it's over. But she was into literature, you know, and, and things being just right. So, I worked with students with this book, and they would go through and they would be, aha, they would come to the session and go, they have one thing circled in the course, and another thing circled, and another thing circled, and they go, look, he's contradicting himself. Why should I believe in this book? Why should I even do the course anymore? Because he's contradicting himself. No, he's not. He's, he's using a bunch of metaphors and words in, in a way that is designed to be as helpful as it can. But it would be like, if, if you were in a lost country somewhere, in, in a lost time and space, and Jesus lowered down a ladder down into your situation and said, climb, okay, then there was a lot of rungs on that ladder. In other words, the ladder is like a climbing device. That's what this is. It's just a climbing device. And the only way that you can climb it is with your willingness. When you start to get in there and start to get into the particulars, like the students we're trying to catch Jesus and say he could have used a better word, he contradicts himself here, this and that. I'm saying, no, this is a climbing device. Why would you compare one rung to another rung? Uh, all he's saying is, grab hold anywhere. <laughs> grab hold anywhere on the ladder and climb. How simple can that be? But what happens when the ego mind gets in there, which is in analysis and so forth, we're trained to analyze it starts to actually try to analyze the climbing device. Even if we're like near the top rungs. Yeah. It's like, well, I didn't play on that rung down there, maybe I'm not doing it right. Yeah. You know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I missed a step. Or what I... <laughs> <laughs> the metaphor I said one time that Jeffrey loved so much was camping out on a rung. There are those that, that get to a rung and they go, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is good enough. I get my pup tent, I set up the, the right. burner, right, the barbecue here. And this is kind of what we were talking about with, with Marianne Williamson or some of you know, yeah. you can actually make a, career, a pretty nice career and you feel fairly good most of the time and you get to keep a little bit of the world and a little bit of God and it's a, it's a problem, but so let's just set up a camp. I'll, I'll mark a flag here and then I said, no camping. <laughs> no camping on the rungs. The rungs are simply for pushing, pushing off of and climbing. Because it's a climbing device, why would you camp on a ladder? I mean, exactly what would be the point of hanging there on the ladder? You know, you're meant to climb and push off the entire ladder and let the ladder go, is really what, it, what he's saying. So. Didn't Jesus say sim uh, words are but symbols of symbols? Yeah, yeah. twice removed from twice reality. Yeah. See, so you're on about Marianne Williamson doing the course in miracles and then writing books based on that. 
so she's quite comfortable spiritually with the book. But then she's got the other side. Uh, you know, the human, what you've just said. I think, I would say, no one is ever comfortable with that book until they don't need it anymore. Then they get comfortable <laughs> with the book. As, as long as you need it, mm. you're yeah, not going to be comfortable yeah, with that Yeah, the point book. I'm saying is that you're saying that Marianne Williamson <laughs> has, moved, has done the Course in Miracles well, and then sort of moved on to the Peace Movement, which isn't in line with that. Yeah, this and you are on about rooms of the ladder. Yeah, this was our discussion yesterday about, yeah. about how how this is a course that's aimed at enlightenment and self-realization. It, it doesn't have anything to do with world peace, because world peace is an oxymoron. Uh, you know, you can have a peaceful perception of the world, but you, you will never have world peace, as the world defines it. Um, you know, in terms of, it's an undoing of all definitions and concepts of, of health, of wellness, of, um, you know, of ecological terms, in terms of go green, uh, save the planet, what planet? You know, I mean, it, it just absolutely uh, pops, pops all the definitions of absolutely everything. Yeah, the point I'm making is on the rungs of the ladder. Yeah. You're, you're all at the top of the ladder? Yeah. Off. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it that way. <laughs> you see it that way, we're right? We're off the top. We're yeah. Actually, we're off the ladder. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> but if you go halfway up the ladder and stop there, is that okay? I say no camping. Yeah, who yeah but you, this is the point I'm making. Yeah. That you, you are truly 100% on that. I say no camping. That's all I say. In fact, with Jeffrey, I would just say no mm. camping on the runs. Why? Yeah. It's because it's meant. they're meant to be pushed off of. You're meant to, to go to know thyself, to self-realization mm. is the whole point of everything. So why would you want to stop short of knowing who you are? It's meant to fit better on the roof than on the roof. Yeah, but can't you see the point that I'm making? Is, you know, we're all sat here now, and it's absolutely fantastic. And then we'll go our separate ways. But you're still in this cocoon. I don't think people even go separate ways. It's, it's once you realize that everyone's in your mind, then it solves everything. But as soon as you think there's a world out there that people could out, actually go out there and go their separate ways and walk a lonely path and struggle and so on and so forth, then that would be rather depressing. Uh, you know, as you were saying, when you were watching Ed TV, it mm. seemed a bit depressing. Um, but, but what I'm saying is, is it's really possible to go all the way. And it's really possible to use the climbing device to, to just climb. Yeah, and but you're saying no camping. Yeah, and no camping. But, and what I'm saying is that when I leave here today, I will be on, you know, rooms of the ladder, but I will be camping. Yeah, why don't you climb? Uh, do you see what I'm... Oh. Margaret, I think you're a climber. Yeah. I've never seen I you as a camper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but what I think is um, being said is that you're going to continue learning, so you're not going to stay there for very long, right? Because you're not going to go home and stop learning the same. You're not going to. You know, you're going to be practicing it. You're taking so it. Yeah, you can yeah. only keep going up, even if today, yeah, you're on a certain, on a certain level. But yeah, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, a little bit more and a little bit more. Yeah, but I mean, you're on about like insurance, this and, you know, buying this. I mean, I love doing photography and I had a guilt complex and I had an exhibition, you know, to make money. And I started feeling guilty about that, so I had the exhibition and I gave all the money to the hospice. <laughs> and I was going to stop doing photography and I thought, no, don't. And I'm carrying on with it, but I have to sell it to produce it. So this is what I'm getting at. It's yeah, this is that. good though. These are the very kind of things we want you to bring up because like I've worked with people who who had no money, who've had lots of money, who've been the head of companies and whatever, and whenever you're doing anything out of the motivation of guilt, like even 
giving money to a charity, if you're doing it out of guilt, you're just reinforcing the guilt in your mind, because it's the motive for which you do something. We were talking about this last night with, with Therese about the corporate world and what's the motive behind things, you know, is the cru crucial thing. It's not whether you seem to have resources or don't, but it's what's the motive, what is the purpose for it. So then Jackie brought up the uh, thing in a practical way to say, okay, so I should just look at my life, you know, for her, for you it's photography, mm -hmm. for her it's, there's other aspects, maybe painting and other things, and I should look at what is it for? Really, truly, you know, is this, am I using this for my awakening, or do I have another purpose for it? And if I have another purpose for it, she was saying, well, that's just to keep me stuck in the world, so I don't need to keep that purpose for that thing, or maybe even that thing, if it's serving that purpose. So, what I was doing was talking about transfer of training, saying, well, let's say you make a list of a lot of aspects of your life, and you start to just honestly and open-eyed look at those things in court of, according to the purpose that you have for it. It's not saying the thing, the photography, is good or bad. Uh, as I know many people that, that are into art and photography mm. and so on and so forth. One time I, I did a gathering in Michigan, and I started talking about idols, you know, and, and what, how down on earth you can seem to worship idols, and it just brings you no true happiness, just guilt. And the Bible said, have no idols before the Lord thy God. So I was giving this talk, and this man, suddenly his name was Stevie, came up to me, and he was like, oh David, I have a terrible idol. I have a terrible idol. I just feel so bad about it now. And he went on and on about this terrible idol, and terrible idol, and finally I said, well, what is your terrible idol? And he said, I have a sailboat, and it's a pretty big one, it's sleep fade, and da 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 but I polish it, and paint it, and I trace like my baby. I put all my time and energy into this sailboat. It's just a, it's just a terrible idol, and I feel so bad and everything. And, and I said, I know a way out of your idol. And he, he said, what? And I said, take your Course in Miracles group out. Sailing. And he was, his eyes lit up. Wow. See, it was just a slight tweak in purpose of the purpose of the boat from an identity attachment, you know, that was an extension of his identity to giving the boat over to the Holy Spirit and why not, at least say, why not go do a Course in Miracles retreat? He was like, wow, you see, it's the same with photography or art, you know, or anything. You can, it's like, what purpose does it serve? That's where the sorrow or the joy will come from. Right. So you shouldn't, if you, if you have this beautiful photography and then you start feeling guilty about it in some way, then the best thing to do would be to just ask the Holy Spirit, okay, what would you have me do? In, in a way that would be helpful, would bless everyone. And, you know, you will receive a guidance or instruction on what would be the helpful way. Just giving away money, uh, I had a friend of mine who, who had lots of money, and she had lots of guilt, too. And she would, like, give away extra bonuses at work, she would, at Christmas time, she was given envelopes of money out to family members, cousins, people that she knew and everything. So they were waiting when Christmas time would come around to go to her house to get a bundle in that envelope. And the more she worked with me, she said, by golly, I've been giving money away out of guilt. I've got all this guilt and I think the more money that I give away will alleviate the guilt. <laughs> and I feel just as guilty <laughs> after I give it away. In fact, they're like leeches now. <laughs> I got all people lined up here at Christmas. I feel like I've got to give it away and I still feel guilty. So I said, yeah, giving the money away, you know, to alleviate the guilt is not going to work. So we had to go much deeper into her mind, you know, to find out where, what the Holy Spirit was guiding her to do, you know, as opposed to her ego ideas. So that's why, you, you know, you, you've just shown up. You didn't have a lot of prior spiritual training and ideas, just last year you just kind of showed up at the retreat and said, okay, this is wonderful, I'm going for it. 
So it's more like Jesus had lowered his ladder down, and you went <laughs> and just grabbed, right. grabbed yeah. on. And now all, all I'm saying is, you don't have to evaluate and judge uh, the rungs in any way. Or where anyone else seems to be. Or where everyone be. else seems to be. That's the uh, best right. use of your time. Okay. <laughs> You see where I was going though, you know, yeah. with it all. I get, with my photography I get, I find it really peaceful and really exciting when you create something, you know, that you really like. Yeah. Then you just give it to the Holy Spirit and yeah. say, what would you have me do with it? You know, we were just talking about this morning about yoga. Mm -hmm. Jackie was asking the same question. She does yoga in the morning and was saying, well, it's kind of body focused, so should I throw that out? You know, would be the question yeah. mm -hmm. if it seems to be focused on the body. So we just talked about purpose and it seems to be helpful. It's a yeah. peaceful experience. She reads a course and has the lesson in her mind and moves through the yoga and it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's not the thing that you seem to do that's good or bad. It's just really very gently asking, does it seem helpful? What is it for? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll go with that. Do you want your cards, dear? <laughs> that was the shortest one. <laughs> Bargain covers are out. <laughs> I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. So the first one was, I'm responsible for what I see, and then I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. So if really there's happiness or no happiness, from that perspective it makes sense. However, it can be easily misunderstood in terms of, I'm going to choose frustration, I'm going to choose like a specific emotion. So that's where the distortion would come in, is if, is if you manifest particular feelings from the personal self. Yeah, it's basically the teachings are that there's love or fear in the metaphorical sense, and that um, we would say that anger and anxiety and depression and envy and jealousy, those are all aspects of fear. You know, because he, he's saying you have but two emotions. So he, again, everything is designed to simplify. And, and even if you wanted to go uh, beyond uh, love and fear, you could say what one is comfortable and one is uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, one is, is feels good and one feels upsetting. And basically, the choice is, is, is coming about as you go much deeper based on what you want. What you desire is, is what you will feel and what you will perceive. But the first one was which really the responsibility word came in there. That I think that's where people, you know, get hung up on that thing of, of thinking, you know, if I'm responsible for fear or I'm res responsible for uh, error or distortions or whatever, then uh, then it would seem like guilt is justified. And we're, we were taking it to the highest point of saying that really you're responsible for choosing the correction. And it's the same with the feelings. You know, you're. You are responsible for choosing happiness. God's will for you is perfect happiness, and there is no choice in heaven. But while you believe in duality, uh, you are responsible for choosing happiness. And, and isn't it great that you're responsible for choosing happiness? You know? That it's something that you can choose. It's always available. It's always available. There's never a moment when happiness is not available. And that, and that goes with, do you want what we've said before, is do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? You know, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be right. There's something wonderful I've learned. Yeah. Mm. You don't need to be right. It doesn't matter. How freeing is that? <laughs> you just feel it in your body. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. And the doozy line. And 
everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Yeah. That's the version, that last one is, of all things work together for good. It's in the Bible. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Now, now, people will say, well, if you break that up again into discrete, specific events, and you look at things like heart attacks, or cancer, or automobile smash-ups, or um, money, coming to you. money coming to you, or money being taken away from you, or all those kind of things, um, those are all specific situations and specific events. And the goal of the Course is to see a unified world. It's it's to see that those specifics are part of the distorted way of perceiving. Uh, and so, it's kind of like, as long as you perceive that last thing from a linear perspective, everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I've asked, you can go, wow, thank you, I'm glad I asked for all the good things, and I'm cursed and feel guilty for all the bad things that I asked for, but it's still seeing it from a very linear perspective, when the whole purpose of the Course is to unify perception. And when we say all things work together for good, we're not saying you ha have to accept the good with the bad, we're saying you have to transcend the perspective of good and bad. You have to actually reach a state of detachment, or a higher, above the battleground, Jesus calls it, where you move away from the linear perspective and you move into the either the vertical or I call it the point, the perspective of the point, which is that everything is unified. So that's why, you know, understanding these things, I, I would say the gist of that whole passage that we just read, Responsibility for Sight, is basically saying, you know, you, you can choose happiness. You can choose love, you can choose joy, in any moment, it's always available. And there also, that goes along with that, is there is never a reason to blame or point the finger at anything or anyone as if something was done to you that you didn't ask for. Uh, that's the value of the passage. And so, what that passage does is it really starts to eliminate projection. Uh, you know, as if there's something else that made me feel this way. You know, it, it undoes that whole false way of thinking, as if people can make us feel a certain way, circumstances can make us feel a certain way, and start to realize, no, I'm, I'm responsible. I choose the feelings I experience, and I can choose to feel love and peace. So as soon as you try to relate that last sentence with a specific event coming to me because of something I've done, or chosen. That's where the error is, to bring it up to a higher level. And I believe I'm on the screen, things seem to happen. That's one decision. I'm off the screen, I'm detached from it all. That's the other decision. Yeah, a miracle, yeah, there's a line, what is a miracle? A miracle does not create nor really change at all. It merely looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. That's a definition uh, from Jesus about what is a miracle. Looks upon devastation and reminds the mind of what it sees as false. Well, that must be from a higher perspective, the miraculous perspective. You can't look at something from a human perspective and feel peace. Uh, how do you look on a tsunami uh, from a human perspective and feel peace? How do you, do you look on an earthquake or uh, a, a hurricane, or a tornado, or a Katrina, some of these things, how, how could you look at from a human perspective and feel peace? You can't, but, but you're being asked to see it from a higher perspective, you know, from a spiritual perspective. And that's the value of the, that's what all these words in the Course are pointing towards that mind training, towards that spiritual perspective. Not to get hung up on the words, you might think of the words as just like little pointing devices, you know. And people have read words for many centuries. Um, I always use Mary Baker Eddy as an example, the founder of Christian Science. That 
she simply read the same Bible that hundreds and thousands of other people were reading all over the place, and kept praying to the Holy Spirit for an interpretation. Show me what you meant by this. What does this scripture mean? You know, she, she didn't try to decipher it in human terms. She simply prayed for inspiration, for a higher interpretation, and she simply used that technique to reach a, a very lofty state of, of healed mind, just using the Bible. That's why when people will say, oh, the Bible is so crude, and you know, I'm glad I've got the course now, the Bible confused me, and the Bible you know, messed me up, and this and this, as if the Bible is to blame for, for someone's state of mind. No, it's just a bunch of images. It's just another ladder. Uh, the Bible is just another ladder. You still have to have the willingness and the faith to climb, uh, no matter what tool that you're using. So there's no point in comparing the tools or saying this tool is better than that tool. You know, that's, that's never helpful. Can you say what you said about America again? What, what you, about it, it does not create or really change at all. It merely looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false.